Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar this evening. My name's Helene and alongside me is Jade. We'll be doing the back part of the webinar, IT and everything. So welcome everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to those past and present. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar and thank you for attending. The majority, just a little bit of housekeeping, the majority of our webinar events are recorded and are freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. We do have a practice communique that goes out fortnightly. Included in this is our external and internal calendar of events. For today's meeting, the participants will be put on mute for the course of this and should you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and they will be addressed at the end of the session tonight. They will be, um, I will answer them on your behalf and they will be all anonymously asked. Uh, please note the West Vic PHN health pathway relating to this topic that is on the screen at the moment. Um, our, our presenter for today is Jan Rice, Wound Management Consultant. I will now hand straight over to Jan to start the presentation. Thanks, Jan. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, and welcome everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about leg ulceration. And we try not to use that word, actually. We try to actually talk about exactly what's caused the ulceration on the legs, but we'll get to that. Um, so uh, the picture on the screen right now would be one uh, that is difficult to heal. It's the anterior shin that is known as uh, one of the hardest areas in the body to heal. And then, of course, if you combine it with some other uh, pathophysiology, such as venous disease, arterial disease or some other pathology, you're doubly hard to heal. So we do know the anterior shin is a hard place to heal. And what we do say is that um, we would prefer to spend one month trying to get it healed. And if we're not making progress, we suggest that possibly they should see a surgeon and have a skin graft to speed it up, only because we do know that uh, it's a hard to heal area. Okay, so I'll just get myself going here because... All right, so the most common causes of of lower leg ulceration. There are many, all right, but the most common. 70% are caused by venous insufficiency or venous disease, also known as CVI, and some people call it venous stasis. 10% roughly are arterial, so pure arterial disease. 2% um, are skin cancers and 8% are autoimmune disorders, so um, such as inflammatory disorders or dermatological disorders. And then the remaining percentage could be mixed venous arterial. So how do you know which is what? Well, the first thing that I would suggest you do is that you actually read the person's medical and surgical history. There's going to be things in there that will allude you to the fact that perhaps it's venous, so they might have had past history of varicose vein surgery or they might have had a DVT, um, so you'd lean a little bit towards the vein side maybe, or they might have had coronary artery bypass grafting and in the old days when they did that of course they took one of the veins out of your leg uh, to use for the uh, heart and and so um, then you're missing one of the major veins of the leg so it could be that. Um, remember also that um, coronary artery bypass grafting would lead you to the fact that perhaps their arterial system is also not working too well and then if they had other things like hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia, um, then you would a smoker, diabetes, you'd start to think about mm, maybe arterial. So I'll come into that in a moment. So medical and surgical history, I would go to always first. For myself personally, I look at it last, right? The reason I look at it last is because I'm trying to use my clinical judgment and keep on top of things and then not be biased by whether it's uh, what's in the medical or surgical history. But when you're first starting out, this is the correct way to do it. 
medical and surgical history. Then, of course, you also are interested in the pharmacological history, and that's because there are certain medications that will cause dependent edema, and so some of that swelling you're seeing may not necessarily be caused by venous insufficiency. Of course, um, the tool that you have to use all the time is your hand. We want you to be palpating the foot pulses. And then you might look at the ulcer and see if it matches some of the characteristics of the common leg ulceration. So here's some of the things that you would be looking for in the medical surgical history. Past history of DVT. About 40% of patients with chronic venous insufficiency have had a DVT. And of that 40%, about 13% have had a silent DVT. They never knew that they had one until they went for a scan. Um, past history of leg trauma, a past history of protein C deficiency, being female, being obese, having evidence of venous hypertension, and not walking correctly, which is the heel toe push off function of your feet. Those who are obviously obese people tend to waddle and that waddling also means they're not got a correct walking gait. So you've got to have a correct walking gait in order to engage your calf muscle pump function. Um, on the arterial side, of course, past history of arterial vessel occlusion, endarterectomies or cabbages, past history of trauma again, having atherosclerosis, being diabetic, hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia and hypertension. The past social history is of interest. So um, on the venous side, if you've had lots of babies, remember when, you have, uh, when you're pregnant and as the baby grows, the baby's pressing on your iliac veins. So eventually it could occlude those iliac veins which means that you're going to have high venous pressures in your lower leg. Um, you do that many, many times, so many babies, eventually those pressures will cause valvular dysfunction. So lots of babies, and then of course big babies. When you've got to bear down and push that big baby out, um, you can get reverse flow in your uh, veins and you can damage valves. Prolonged uh, occupations of prolonged standing, uh, and a family history of lower leg ulceration, particularly venous. We do not know why, but venous disease does run in families. One thing that's not on there that I remember a professor teaching me years ago is I should always ask if the patient suffers from constipation because all that pushing also when they're constipated will cause venous hypertension and hemorrhoids are in fact varicose veins of your bum. Arterial disease. Uh, the social side is a uh, smoker. Now, remember that the evidence shows that passive smoking can do as much damage as, as being an actual smoker. And a case in hand, I remember in my clinic, I was sure this lady had arterial disease, but when I asked her, had she been a smoker, she said no. And then she told me she ran a pub for 40 years. Well, you know, all those years ago, everybody smoked in the pub and, you know, you could hardly see your way through to the, the bar. So she was a passive smoker. So I was probably right. She did have an arterial ulcer. High fat cholesterol intake diet, being inactive uh, and older age. Now, there are some obscure things and you won't find this really written in the uh, literature so much. These are my observations. But um, I think people with venous ulcers are quite vague. They can't actually tell you how it began. They're very vague. Whereas the opposite occurs for arterial ulcers. The patients usually remember exactly what happened to that leg and how they sustained that wound. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that venous tends to be seen in community or what we call low care uh, settings. Uh, whereas those who are in high care tend to be nursed in bucket fallout chairs, uh, princess chairs or magic mobility chairs or whatever, and they tend to have their legs up. So even if they had venous disease, they currently, when their legs are up, they don't have venous hypertension. So uh, that's obscure, but that's my findings over years and years of being in the area. Now, with regard to what you're looking for, you're not looking for one of these, you're looking for a cluster of these characteristics. So you're looking for edema, and it's that sort of spongy edema, but it does pit, but at the same time it's spongy. 
as opposed to, you know, with a congestive cardiac failure edema, you can actually touch it and you feel the water rippling under your fingers. It, it's, CCF edema is very, very different from venous edema. If this person has had a problem for a long, long time, they end up with scar tissue down the bottom, the lower third of their lower leg. That's called lipodermatosclerosis. And it feels like a piece of wood. So what happens if they sit all day and they're not active, et cetera? The edema can't penetrate that because it is like a piece of wood. So they get this really big calf. And so that's where the inverted champagne bottle shape comes in. The ulcer itself has an irregular shape. And I used to say it was like if you took a bucket, remember the days when we collected the water from the shower and you stood and you threw it in the garden and it hit the soil and then dust and everything flew off. Well, that's under high pressure. That water landing onto the soil was high pressure when it landed, so it blasted. So it's the same thing with a venous ulcer. The, the high pressures are blowing the skin away, and so you've got this irregular edge. The ulcer begins on the medial or lateral aspect of the lower third of the lower leg. The ulcer is wet, shallow, with minimal necrotic tissue. There may be a thing called atrophy blanche. There may be eczema and pigment staining and uh, lipodermatosclerosis. But in most people, you can palpate the pulses. Uh, and these are generally um, not too painful. They're uncomfortable, but these people quite like to sit with their legs up and they keep their legs up because it's quite comfortable. There are also the people who say, oh, I have ankles in the morning and cankles in the evening. So some of the characteristics that you see here. So far left, pretty typical of a straightforward venous leg ulcer. The one next to that, so moving to, to the right, um, this is a venous leg ulcer. Sorry, this is probably a mixed disease because you can see it's got some depth to it um, and it's got quite a considerable amount of slough. And of course, there's so much leakage because of the vein side of it, uh, that it's excoriating the peri-wound area. The next is someone who actually does have lymphedema as well as venous disease. And what you're looking at there is the pigmentation, the crusting of all her uh, skin changes with the venous disease, um, uh, causing all that crusting and pitting um, that she has there. And the far right is atrophy blanche. So those white, um, areas that you see in the lower part of the lower leg that have like little white rivers with little red dots in it. Whereas arterial ulcers, these are located between the ankles and the toes, that's called the foot, and high up on the leg or on the back of the leg, it's quite unusual for a venous leg ulcer to start on the back of the leg. It may eventually become circumferential, but that's why we always ask, where did it start? Um, these are deep and they're punched out and have a regular shape and they're dry until such time as they become infected. Once they've wrapped, and they do rapidly infect, um, then they will be wet. The skin may be thin, shiny and non-hair bearing and thickened toenails is also a characteristic. But these two, um, can throw you off. So don't forget there are nationalities or ethnicities that don't have hairy legs. And about 65% of people over the age of 80 have fungal nail disease. Of course, with these ones, the pulses are hard to find, uh, or you may find them, but they're very weak. There's a condition called elevation pallor, dependent rubor. This means that when the patient's lying on the bed, you pick their legs up, you stand at the back, you pick their legs up, you look and see if the colour drains out of their foot and it starts to go white. If it does, then you sit them up and you put the foot to the floor and there's this flush of red. So that's the dependent rubor. That's a very, very good test. And in fact, I have a paper that I found on, I had, um, when I was doing my studies, I found a paper that said that Berger's test was as good as doing an ankle brachial pressure index. And I couldn't find that paper again, but just recently I found it. So there is evidence that Berger's test is very, very predictive of arterial disease, particularly small vessel arterial disease. And as I said, they will rapidly, uh, they can become necrotic quite rapidly. Uh, and 
and uh, there's pain, especially at night or when elevated. So they can look like this, all right? Uh, so you can see the dependent rubor on the left uh, wound. You see the wounds between the toes. They're horrifically painful. You can see the rotting toenails. And you can see the wound on the dorsum of the foot. It's just like someone got a punch biopsy and went punch and pulled the skin out. Of course, any blackened area on the toes, if you can't account for what happened, you'd be thinking arterial disease. And then you can see some other pictures on the right there. So why do these occur? Well, in order to understand and then be able to explain these ulcers to your patients, you must understand the anatomy of the lower leg and the physiology of the circulatory system. So with regard to the venous system, the most common um, systems we talk about are the superficial venous system and the deep venous system. The superficial venous system forms a network in the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and the deep is found in the muscle compartment below the deep fascia. Here's just a picture that I love to show, showing how many veins are on the foot. And when you see the underside of this foot, uh, you can fully understand why the walking, the gait, uh, is very important so that you drain the fluid out as you walk. And we also have another system. So you have your superficial in the deep, but you also have your perforating veins, which in my training day were called the communicating veins. Um, now the network uh, of superficial dra veins drain into the deep venous system via the perforating or communicating veins. And these contain a single one-way valve directing blood flow from the superficial to the deep system. So this is what I actually draw on a piece of paper for my patients. So they understand the way in which the blood gets back from the skin, the venous blood gets back up to the heart and lungs for reoxygenation and recirculation. So I draw exactly this picture. Um, now, um, as you can see here, the valves are, um, uh, open when there's muscular contraction and then they close when it relaxes. So open and shut, it's very much like a bivalve system. So in order to deliver blood to the heart and prevent the reflux of the venous system, we need negative intrathoracic pressure. So take a deep breath and when you take a deep breath, your diaphragm raises and that sucks some blood, some venous blood back up into your venous system. So breathing, deep respirations, excellent. You need valvular competence. So look at the screen and see the valves, how they are in both the superficial and the deep system. You need an active lower limb muscular system. And so this is why sometimes when people are, um, what's the word, uh, immobile and, and not um, active with their muscle, then there is a big issue. They get this edema because the valves eventually give way due to the pressure on them. And then compression of the venous plexus of the foot uh, when weight bearing. So here you see a picture of a normal valve open, a normal valve closed, and then of course, where the veins have had this distension and they've stretched over time and now that poor valve can't reach, they can't reach together and so they're constantly leaking. So um, here you will see that the uh, calf, deep calf vein one-way valves open during contraction and they close at rest. And the perforator one-way valves are closed during contraction and they open at rest to fill the deep system. So as I said before, it's very much a bivalve uh, uh, system. Again, sorry to harp on it, but it's just trying to show you what happens when you use that calf muscle pump, all right? And so you can see the calf muscles relaxed and the valves are closed. And then when the calf muscle contracts, it pushes and the fluid and the fluid goes up, opens the valve, then that valve will close again because the calf muscles relaxing. 
and there's the one of the foot that I wanted to show you. Look at all those veins in the foot. So if you have flat feet, you're not going to be compressing these as much as someone who has a high arch and then wearing footwear. You know, all your footwear has got that little padding just inside for your arch. And so when you walk properly, you are milking your uh, plantar foot plexuses. With regard to the arterial system, uh, obviously we talk about uh, the deep and the superficial again. So you have the iliac, uh, iliac common femoral vein, you have the, the superficial femoral, you have the posterior tibial, the anterior tibial, and the dorsalis pedis, to name a few. So the correct functioning of the arterial system is largely under the influence of the cardiac pump. It all starts up here because there's no valves in the, in the uh, arterial system. It's a muscle. And what it hopes is that pump, your heart, pushes the fluid out and then that goes all the way along and the, the stretchiness of your artery stretches out and it's just a pulsatile effect. So the further you are away from your heart, it's probably just a little dribble down there. If you haven't got a really good uh, pump, then you're not going to uh, get it all the way down the other end. So in lower leg ulceration, looking at only one system can be thought with danger. You need to look at the entire circulatory system and consider how it is meant to be working together to create homeostasis. We therefore, when we've done our assessment completely, looking at the medical, surgical, social, pharmacological, and done our assessment, um, looking at the characteristics and trying to palpate the pulses, we'll come up with this person has venous hypertension, this person has peripheral arterial disease, or they may have lymphedema, or they may have a combination of lymphedema and venous disease, or they could have a combination of venous disease and arterial disease. And that is why the term peripheral vascular disease is no longer taught. Because when people talked about peripheral vascular disease, they did not tell us what system was not functioning. So venous hypertension and lower limb wounds. Uh, the pathophysiology behind them is uh, ineffective muscle pump. So you've got to look at that. Remember, anyone who's had a fused ankle is not going to get as good calf muscle pump function. Uh, and then, of course, there can be people who are uh, congenitally have congenital absence of their valves or they have obstruction or distension. And remember, that's where the pregnancy comes in. But I had a patient in my own clinic. I could not work out why one leg was more swollen than the other. So we sent her off for an abdominal ultrasound and we found a tumour in her stomach pressing down there. So venous hypertension causes vein dilatation. It causes distortion of the capillary bed with associated stasis and it increases capillary permeability leading to the leakage of fluid and macromolecules. So if you think it's venous, start asking them questions like, what's your occupation? Because definitely occupation has something to do with it. Hairdressers, truck drivers, they're, they're pretty high in our groups. Um, certainly when I took up lecturing at the university, I started wearing compression because my legs were achy and tired all the time. And you may feel the same because nurses, whilst they're on their feet a lot, tend not to be doing active walking, like going for a 30 minute walk. Ask about their mother and father or their grandparents because we know that there is a family history. And then questions like, do they get tired, heavy legs at the end of the day? How did it start? Have they ever had a DVT? How many children have they had? And uh, ha have they had surgery and how often? Because remember, when they had surgery, they could have had a, a silent DVT. Peripheral arterial disease and lower limbs, of course. The main thing is arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. 
where the fatty plaque material builds up in the arteries and causes a narrowing and eventually that narrowing causes inflammation which means that the muscular wall now is uh, because it's been inflamed for so long it's become stiff and therefore they don't get that beautiful um, rebound so when you're using your doppler and we did our doppler training i said to you you'll get a monophasic sound because the 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 blood vessel wall muscular wall is stiff therefore they get no pum 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 like that um so this is what they can look like so you can see this uh, the left hand side very parched um skin, the skin sorry the skin looks very hungry uh and then of course on the other side you can see he's had an amputation and still got a necrotic nasty wound so if you're suspicious you'll ask have you been a smoker have you ever had high blood pressure have you ever had a high cholesterol count have you ever had your arteries cleaned out have you ever had a heart attack or a stroke have you ever had an episode where you blacked out for a short time so tias is there a family history of heart disease and of course you'd want to know their age so what tests can we do to confirm our clinical diagnosis well, we want you to be palpating pulses and it is a skill. And when you start to first do it, if you press really hard, you actually block the vessel. So you've got to palpate fairly lightly. Of course, if there's edema, try to massage the edema out of the way and then get your hand on there and gently move around until you can feel it. Um, you can do the ankle brachial pressure index or you can do the toe brachial pressure index. There is a thing called lennox shear uh, oximetry index. It's not widely taught and there's not a great deal of evidence and it does have some discrepancies. So you can get some false positives. Of course, if we are really concerned and want to take some action, then we're really doing an arterial or a venous duplex scan uh, would be very helpful because then what we can do is we can identify where the problem is. Now remember, uh, these sonographers will only do one leg of one system each day. So you can't send a patient in there and have both their arteries and their veins looked at in their right leg. Uh, they won't do that. They do one system and that's all to do with Medicare rebate and the time that it takes to do this. It takes about an hour to scan one system in one leg. Um, more fancy tests that can be done usually in the vascular laboratory are air and photoplethysmography. And then, of course, we can do transcutaneous uh, oxygen pressures as well. So where do you find the vessels that you want? Well, we want the dorsalis peters. So the markers are the first web space. So between the big toe and the next toe, draw an imaginary line up until midway between the two ankle bones. And somewhere along there, you should find the dorsalis pedis. Um, you can do uh, the posterior tibial. So that's the medial uh, side of the foot and it's behind the ankle bone. And I always find stretching the foot out allows me to get in behind that muscle better. Um, popliteal is not easy to find. I certainly am not skilled at it, mainly because I don't practice it. Um, but behind your knee, the knee must be flexed and behind the knee, you'll find a triangle and you've got to palpate in that triangle. Of course, femoral, we can all have a go at. You're also looking for capillary refill time, which should be less than 30 seconds and you're feeling temperature. Now, temperature will vary uh, depending on climate and you know some people do just have naturally cold feet. So you have to take that into consideration. There's the posterior tibial for palpation. Um, so the uh, invasive diagnostic procedures could be ambulatory venous pressures, uh, ascending venography and descending venography, but these are not being done anywhere near so much because they are invasive. And our sonographers, particularly in vascular labs, are uh, getting better and better. So um, sadly for rural regions, you might not have any choice and you just send them to a normal scanning place and they don't do them regularly. They may not be as good as sending them to a proper vascular lab. Of course, and most of those sit in big hospitals.
Um, so uh, why did I put test summary? Um, I don't know why I put that word test summary there. Um, but so from the Venus, you can be, do the Venus duplex scan, the Venus reflux testing, uh, ADPI, uh, or elevate the leg and the edema subsides. Um, and then the arterial, you can do duplex scan, Virgus test, ABPI, toe pressures. And there is also another one called an exercise stress test. Uh, that again is done in a laboratory, um, but they put the, the patient on a treadmill and they do the pressures before they get on the treadmill, then they get them on the treadmill and then they slowly increase the angle, which makes the resistance. And if they get a pain in their calf or their buttock, um, then it's fairly conclusive that the muscles are not getting the oxygen and that's why they've got that cramp. Um, we've already, for some of you, I know there are people on here though who haven't done the Doppler and the ankle brachial pressure in index. Um, so having a Doppler and doing an ankle brachial pressure index is a great idea. Uh, my colleague here actually is holding the probe a little too at, much at right angles. I probably took the photo at the wrong time and she was probably playing around. The probe must be at 45 degrees to the skin with a good dollop of uh, um, gel, the same kind of gel that we used to use when you were doing cardiac monitoring, etc. Um, so the electro gel. Um, you can see that they've got a piece of blood wrap over the wound so that the blood pressure cuff doesn't get contaminated. Now the normal, and I, this can vary depending on the reference that you're using. So the normal <coughs> ankle brachial pressure index is somewhere between 0 0.8 and 1.2. If you get to 1.3, it's considered to be an, uh, a non-compressible and the hardening of the arteries. If you're at 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, then you've got claudication, uh, but it should still heal. Uh, less than 0 0.4, you'll have adverse outcomes for foot wounds, and less than 0 0.2, the entire limb is threatened. With regard to toe uh, brachial pressure uh, indexes, uh, the normal is 0 0.8. Um, less than 0 0.65 is abnormal. And if you've got 0 0.35, you've probably got claudication. And at 0 0.1, they probably are saying they have severe pain, rest pain. Now the pros and cons of doing a duplex scan. Uh, a duplex scan really is non-invasive. And that's what we wanna go for these days because we do have people who are allergic to the dyes let alone it's relatively traumatic to have invasive procedures. So um, it's non-invasive. You get a rapid and accurate uh, response in experienced hands. It's relatively inexpensive to the patient and the proprietor. Um, it gives you a dynamic physiological information because the sonographer can see exactly the pumping and what's going on. Then they're able to see where there's any reflux if it's in the the veins because the patient for a venous ultrasound actually stands up so that you've got that venous high pressure and then the sonographer will press on the various valves and see if they stay shut or they open quite quickly. Um, you can get segmental uh, pressures so you can assess segmental disease in a laboratory as well. You can also obviously get some other pathology determined. It's safe in pregnancy and it's safe for those with contrast allergies. Um, as I said with duplex scanning for veins, uh, the patient must not be examined lying down. Uh, there's a 70% error when the patients are supine. But the issue then is the patient's got to stand for quite a long time, so they could have a vasovagal. Um, so often what happens is that if it's a bed that will tilt, then they're at least sort of still upright but laying down, if you know what I mean. Um, if they're standing, there's something for them to hold on to. Um, and of course, encouraging them to make sure they've had a good drink before they uh, get to have that done. Uh, the arterial diagnostic investigations uh, the arterial duplex scans, and then the segmental pressures or continuous wave Dopplers. Uh, these are all done in laboratories. And if you get the opportunity to uh, watch a sonographer doing his work, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, some of you in the country do have access to 
um, some quite good uh, sonographers uh, and I would really encourage you to, to ask, would you mind if I came one day and had a look at what you do? They're generally nice people. So hence compression therapy is required in order to get the ulcer healed. So, you know, there's lots of theories out there. There's, there's really quite a lot of theories, but regardless of the theory, venous hypertension is the main cause. So you can see this person's got blowouts of these veins. Uh, and what we need to do is squash those veins so that they're flat. And therefore there's no leakage into the interstitial spaces, which sets up that inflammatory response and that's when you then get that kind of lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, and if they've got a wound, then they're just going to leak, leak, leak. All right, so this is um, Bill McGuinness put this slide together and gave it to me. So this is uh, exactly what happens. So I'll just get them all up so that I can talk to them. Went too far. Okay, so venous hypertension leads to changes uh, to do in the vein due to shear pressures. So you can imagine the the pressure in those veins, the regurgitation, because it's high pressure. So it's blasting the fluid down there, and that regurgitation leads to the release of inflammatory cytokines. Um, those, some of those cytokines that get out are leukocytes and they're quite big. So once they leak out of the vein, they can't get back into the vein. So now they're sitting in the tissues. Um, and it was Coleridge Smith that did a study and he took blood from someone's arm and then took blood from someone's leg. And the, the difference in the leukocytes was quite dramatic. And so he, he came up with that trapping of leukocytes. Um, that caused the damage, but that, that was just one theory. Now the trapping and activation of the leukocytes leads to infiltration of the capillary wall and bicuspid valve damage. So what that then does is leads to capillary damage with increased capillary permeability. Then you get larger molecules, even larger than the leukocytes, so you get the fibrinogen leaking out. And it's that fibrinogen uh, the macromolecules that are leaking out that are going to start to cause that pigment staining in the leg. Now, because it's fibrinogen and it's out in those spaces, eventually it sets. So you get fibrin scarring and skin changes. So there's both inflammatory changes in the venous system and there are mechanical changes in the venous system. So what are the rare types of leg ulceration? Because there are quite a few out there. Um, so there's, and this isn't the exclusive page, by the way. Um, so there's SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. There's collagen vascular disorders. There's antiphospholipid syndrome, although I've only ever seen two in my entire career. So it's quite rare. There's protein C or protein S deficiency and other hypercoagulability syndromes. I certainly would tell you if you had a youngster, so somebody 35-ish uh, lying on your clinic bed with disgusting veins, I would definitely be doing some blood tests checking for protein C deficiency or protein S deficiency um, um, because that's been my experience. I had some young people and I've gone, oh my God, your legs are terrible. And then we've done the bloods and found out. Um, the cryoglobulinemias, vasculitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, and then of course everybody knows the Borrelia ulcer or Mycobacterium ulcerans or also known as the Bensdale ulcer. Now, it would be lovely to be able to diagnose these, but what we want really for the majority of nurses in community settings, whether you're working for an agency, uh, uh, going into someone's house, or whether you're working in a GP practice, or whether you're working in aged care, they're all called community settings. We want you to be able to at least diagnose a venous ulcer, an arterial ulcer, and have a suspicion that it might be a mixture of venous and arterial. Because if you do that, you're looking, you've diagnosed 80% of the, 
of le lower leg ulceration. These things here and others only are 8%. And remember, of course, you've also got skin cancers. So how do we manage the most common of these ulcers? Well, venous elevation without a doubt. And it's really frustrating for me when I go to an aged care facility and I say, we've got to get the legs up. And of course the resident won't do it, won't do it, won't do it. One day we go in and we go, oh, I've had enough. Send it to hospital. We send it to hospital. There is no armchair in hospital. So where do they spend their time? On the bed. Guess what? They come back to the aged care facility with the wounds nearly healed because their legs have been up. If we could only get them to understand more, elevate, elevate, elevate. But it's not just elevate the foot off the floor on a little stool. It's elevate the toes higher than the groin. The textbook actually says elevate the foot higher than the heart, but that is really uncomfortable on your hip. The best way to elevate for elderly people is to lay on the couch, throw a pillow down the other end and stick their leg up on the pillow. Of course, if you've managed a venous ulcer and you've got them healed, then they need to go into compression or support therapy. All right, and I like that word support therapy more than compression. Compression sounds like you're gonna put their leg in a vise and just turn the handle. You need to manage the ulcer according to the tissue, but also obviously according to the exudate and the pain, other things as well. They should have analgesia to keep them comfortable. And for venous, we want them to walk and walk properly and as often as they like. All right, without walking 10 kilometres. Arterial though, if we're really determined that we want to heal this arterial ulcer, we need vascular surgery. There is no dressing that brings oxygen to the wound. All right, so we need to re-establish oxygenation to the tissue. So you want a vascular surgeon. These are very painful. And if you are working in a community setting, if your GP will give as much analgesia as the patient's allowed to have, they will get their legs up because you've asked them to. And if they put their legs up, then you will stop some of that dependent edema pressing on their arteries. So some people say, don't ask a patient with arterial disease to elevate. There is an excellent paper that talks about elevate the leg, then they get a pain, put the leg down. When they think of it, put the leg up again, put the leg down and up, down, up, down. That yo-yo actually each day pushes the new blood vessels a little bit further and a little bit further and they grow uh, collateral vessels. Now, collateral vessels will compress really easily. So if they get edema, the collaterals are compressed. So if we can grow collaterals, we often can heal arterial ulcers, but it takes us a long time. Um, manage the tissue according to the type. Now, if it is true uh, arterial, it will be dry. And then the evidence then is keep it dry. And of course, because these have no oxygen, bacteria love the area, and so you have to use an antimicrobial. Um, so if you're managing the tissue according to uh, what you see and are trying to achieve, healthy granulation tissue generally requires a protective mesh uh, and something to absorb. Poor quality granulation tissue usually requires an antimicrobial. Slough requires an antimicrobial and some mechanical means to aid debriding. And infective tissue requires an antimicrobial and super absorbent pad. So the types of compression therapy that are out there. There are lots, all right. These are all the, the two layer bandage systems. So some of you might have um, grown up in the days of the four layer bandage systems and then 3M were very smart and they brought out the two layer and we all fell in love with the two layer. And then since then, of course, many, many companies have introduced two layer. Um, so there is good evidence supporting these compressive uh, systems and what you will learn when you do undertake training with these compressive systems is that once you put the second layer on so the first layer with most of them 
is a comfort layer. They call it a comfort layer or padding layer or something like that. And then the second layer is cohesive. It sticks to itself. And once it stucks to itself, it is inelastic. I was saying to the group, I am a little tired because the last night and the night before, I think the, the nights I've lost day, track of days, um, I've been attending a conference in Europe. So I, the conference starts at 6 p.m. our time and finishes at 3 a.m. So last night there was a really good discussion around uh, compression therapy and the evidence definitely now, there's, there's a Cochrane review in fact, uh, showing that inelastic systems work better than elastic. And that's what one of these is, that, or these are inelastic systems. The most common system out there in the community settings, however, happens to be tubi grip. Now one piece of tubi grip is elastic, okay? So you, you've got your, your tubi grip, or any other brand name of that sort. And yes, it's elastic. So if a person's got a piece of tubi grip on their leg and they sit all day, eventually that tubi grip is going to allow expansion. So they are going to get edema. So um, a really common way of managing this is to use three layers of tubi grip. And I know the patients get a bit hysterical. Um, so you, the first layer is toes to two fingers behind the knee crease. The second layer is toes to two thirds the lower leg, and the third layer is toes to one third the lower leg, which means over the wound, if it's venous, and of course that's what we're using compression therapy for, um, over the venous ulcer you'll have three layers of the tubi group, over the calf you'll have two, and then at the knee you'll have one. And that is graduated compression. But um, Hugo Parsh, Professor Parsh, he showed that when you put two layers of these products on, or three, eventually the product becomes stiff. So three layers of straight elasticated tubular bandage is also considered to be a stiff product. One layer is not, but when you start to up, double up, you're then getting a stiffer component. Of course, once you heal them, they have to go into maintenance therapy and there's all kinds of products out there um, i personally prefer closed toes and there is no evidence to go higher than the knee but some patients prefer it because what it does is push the fluid to their knee and they've, if they've already got osteoarthritis of their knee then they're going to have fat knees and that hurts their arthritis so they might need to go into a thigh high garment some patients like to wear sandals or whatever, and so they want the no toes. Uh, and then of course, there are companies that have ones with zips in them, so that makes getting them on easier. Um, nowadays, there's some pretty fancy garments out there. Um, certainly some of these, there is no evidence. So these are some that I wear. I don't ask my patients to wear these, um, but you people could. Um, there's no evidence that these deliver graduated compression because they're not considered medical hosiery, but they still do um, provide really good support, I have to say. But I wouldn't put a patient in them because I don't have the evidence of the graduation of pressure. So that's my little spiel on lower leg ulceration. I've got about 12 minutes for questions, um, and I'm hoping that there will be some. Um, so I'm happy to hand over to the team. Thanks, Jan. Um, it's Helene here. So if you've got any questions, please type them in the question box. I do have one to start off with. I just want to check the capillary refill time. Did you say less than 30 seconds? I had previously heard three seconds is normal. Three seconds? I'll have to check then, maybe. I'll have to check. I thought it was 30 seconds. Um, maybe somebody else could, um, I'll have to look. It's so long since I've actually said that to someone that I, I um, yeah, normally I press and then I go one, two. Oh yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's three, thanks. I'll have to look it up as well though. Thanks, Jan. 
Um, how do you increase compliance with compression stockings? Um, okay, I have a little trick. When I measure them and just say they're on the cusp, I don't have a box here. Um, so just say they're on the cusp between one size and then the other. So say the ankle, so the ankle measurement is uh, up to 26 centimetres and then that's just say a small. And the next size is uh, 26 to 36. Just say it, I'm just because I don't have a box in front of me. If they are right on the 26, I don't get that size. I go to the next size. So that the first pair they buy may be one size up, but at least they're comfortable. And if you get them used to it, then when they come back for their next set, because obviously they'll buy two the first time, when they come back for their next set, you would re-measure them and you might be able to say, oh, your, your circumferences have changed. You're actually down one centimetre. So if they come down to 26, then they're quite nicely fitting into the smaller garment. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you like zinc bandages for venous ulcers? For a true venous ulcer? Yes, I do. All right, but there's some conditions. If you're using zinc, and, and the reason we use zinc is because a venous ulcer is only missing skin and zinc aids epithelialization. So if, um, if, you, if you've only got a pure venous, you can put the zinc on, but then the teaching is you use all your other wrappings or whatever you're going to be using, and it should stay undisturbed for one week. And that's a pretty good thing to be aiming for because, you know, a zinc bandage now, the Ziplocs are around $22. So you don't want to be changing that every couple of days. So the issue I have is there are people on, on aged care, the patient will often wee on their bandage or urine will dribble down um, or it gets wet in the shower. And so it's really hard to use zinc bandages in an aged care facility. But if you're in general practice and you've got a pretty good patient that you can work with uh, and you're sure it's not gonna get wet, then zinc bandages are lovely, really good. Thank you. Should you ever debride an arterial ulcer? Ah, good question. Um, so Jan Rice does. Uh, Melinda Brooks does, Terry Swanson does. So the teaching is no, you shouldn't, right? The teaching is no. However, there will come a time when the tissue is hanging. So I've got lots of people in aged care with black heels and we hold on to the black and we hold on to the black. But you have to understand what is your body trying to do? Remember, when you die, if you died now and fell on the ground, uh, you would turn into liquid eventually, all right? You rot. So what the body does is the body recognises it's got a piece of dead tissue there and it doesn't like it. So it sends fluid down. And some of you might have seen this. You have dry black and then over time, it actually starts to get quite thick. It fills up. And as it fills up, it starts to lift off the bed. Well. Clearly, the body wants to get rid of it. So the sooner you get rid of it, the better. But you've got to be skilled, all right? So I now am very skilled at amputating toes. I'm quite skilled at a lot of things, mainly because in aged care, the, we send them to acute care. The acute care vascular surgeon says, amputate. The patient says, no, thank you. They come back to aged care and now we're left to deal with it. And so I've become a little bit of a mini surgeon at times when the body is trying to get rid of something, I'll help it. And I have a number of cases that have done very, very well, particularly because we're encouraging collateral circulation. If you can keep your patient well hydrated, 
you keep those vessels full and good. Um, they're eating really well. You can grow collaterals and then we heal these wounds. And I know lots of surgeons say to me, you'll never heal it, Jan, but we do. So, so does that answer the question for that person? Um, you shouldn't if you're inexperienced. You shouldn't if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you shouldn't if you don't know how to do the debridement, what we call conservative sharp debridement, then you shouldn't, all right? But yes. for people yes, like myself, considered to be a consultant, my hand is forced sometimes. Um, thank you. Yes, she said that she'd answer her question. Uh, next question. Should made to measure compression stockings only be used after the wound is healed with a bandage system or three layer tubic grip while there is ulcer ulceration? No. Um, so great question again. You're asking good questions, guys. Um, no, if you can get a stocking on or a sock on or a garment on, I just realised there's a garment missing and that's the Velcro wraps. I'm so sorry. I must have deleted a slide. I'll talk to that in a minute. Um, so the answer is if you can get a garment on, your patient's probably going to be more comfortable. And, you know, aesthetically it will look nice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the problem and the reason why we go into the other systems, so bandages or tubi group, um, is because usually we're trying to manage the exudate, date. And so some of these garments uh, might get wet. And if they get wet, then you've got to wash them. The more you wash them, the sooner they're going to wear out. So um, we want about six months out of our garments. So if we're constantly washing them, they'll wear out faster and they're not cheap. So the answer would be if you are having to deal with exudate and you have large dressings, you're better to bandage or the slide that's missing from here is the Velcro wraps. So that's become very popular now. All companies that make um, the bandages uh, or have the garments also have a Velcro wrap. And that's really made a headway in aged care even for compression in aged care, because it's literally put the leg on it and pull the two Velcro things over until you reach the knee. So Velcro wraps everyone. I do apologize. It's missing out of my slide deck. Thank you, next question. Is there ever a wound that you wouldn't do an ABPI on or is it okay as long as the wound is covered with the GLAD wrap? Oh, let me ask, answer the first. I think that's a two part question. Uh, is there ever a wound you wouldn't do an ABPI on? Um, well, uh, when you get really, really skilled, you don't need that piece of equipment because there are false positives with ABI. You can get your, um, errors in your readings. So um, when you get really, really clever, you can almost diagnose without the ankle brachial pressure index. However, there are some patients who you know they've got arterial disease and you know that if you put that blood pressure cuff on them and start pumping it, they are going to scream. So you can tell. So it's a very painful wound. And you're going to try and put a blood pressure cuff on it and pump it up to 150, 160, 170. Uh, you're likely, uh, the patient will tell you and scream and tell you to stop it. So you, if you're suspicious of, about bad pain, you wouldn't do an ankle brachial pressure index. If it's severely infected, you wouldn't put them through that. Squeezing of them, you get the infection under control first and then perhaps do your investigations later. And as you become very efficient with your clinical uh, observations and you're looking at their medical and surgical history, you will find you need less and less that evidence before you say, because why do you do it in, as a nurse? You do it so you can say, you need to see a vascular surgeon, you need your arteries fixed, or you need to see a vascular surgeon because your veins aren't working properly. So um, you'll get better and better and be able to, you don't need the equipment. You can just say, look, I'm, pretty sure you've got venous disease. I hope that's explained it enough. 
Um, next question, what would you recommend for those leaky legs? You know, the ones that are dripping while in the treatment room chair. Okay, that, that, that came up last night, leaky legs came up last night, a team from England were, were speaking. Um, it's hard, they all agreed, it, it's really hard. Look, if it's, um, if it is your patient who has congestive cardiac failure, which is often the case, all right, or chronic renal disease, um, you're looking at palliation anyway. You're looking at end of life. These people may not be going to make it. Um, so you do comfort care. You make sure that you have someone who can go in and change those dressings every day. And you're mopping the fluid and you're putting a little bit of something on. Now, I personally, in CCF, I find double layer of tubi fast. So that's the retention sleeve, the one with the blue line for the majority of people. That is really, really good at just pushing out a bit of cardiac edema. Um, with elevation, of course, if she can elevate and toe and ankle and toe exercises. Um, but yeah, leaky legs cause everyone a headache. Um, so I've got a patient down in Mornington I've consulted on today and we're going to use a booster pad to mop up the fluid rather than a medical product um, because they're changing the medical product uh, twice a day. It's costing them about $12 uh, each dressing, so $24 a day uh, for um, ulcers that the surgeon has said may never heal. Thank you, and another question. What's your thoughts of using antimicrobial ointments on wounds? For example, back to bran or canicone. Does it does that work or is it ineffective slash pointless slash contributing to antimicrobial resistance? Antimicrobial. Um, no, actually. So I, I've just ordered someone uh, canicone last night. Um, so let's go. Back to bran, there is MRSA resistance to it. So we would prefer not to use it, Bactroban, and you will also be able to go to the wound infection document and you will find that um, there are a couple of antimicrobials that they say we can use topically and Bactroban's not one of them. So Kenicone is one of them, but we only use Kenicone if we believe the wound is vasculitic. All right, so not, a lot of people get confused when you use that word vasculitic. They think, oh, vascular. So then they think arterial. No, I said vasculitic, so vasculitis. It is an autoimmune inflammatory disorder. They are a very distinctive. Um, they have a red edge to them. They're seen in people who have other autoimmune inflammatory disorders, um, and they're very painful, and the kenicone will calm them down. So we use kenicone for vasculitis, and the other topical antimicrobial we use is metronidazole gel, and that is used for malodorous wounds. And they're the only two in the wound infection guideline available from the Wound Infection Institute that uh, they have said you can use uh, topically. So you have to have a reason to use, you have to be able to state, I'd like kenicone because this is vasculitis and we can go back and look at that person's medical history and see they have rheumatoid arthritis, they have uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, etc. myalgia. Thank you, Jan. That seems to be the end of the questions now. So um, if there's no other questions and there's no other comments from Jan, can I just take this opportunity to thank you, Jan. We're so lucky to have you with all the meetings that you do you are able to fit us in and i'm sure we will have you back on our agenda for 2022 um, so good luck with all your work and conferences and thank you for everyone for attending please fill out your evaluation and any topics from from this or any other thing we would we would welcome those so thank you again thank everyone you yeah, if anyone thinks of any late questions, you can send them through to uh, the staff and they can support with them on to me as a, as a 
you know, all in one and I'll write back and then they can disperse it again. So if you think of something else, look, there's great information on the, uh, the websites, Wounds International, uh, European Wound Management Association, and then of course the Venus guidelines are on the Australian uh, Wound, uh, Wounds Australia. So, you know, there's heaps of information out there. I've just given you a synopsis of it and hopefully straightforward enough that you know what you're supposed to be looking for in a community setting. So thanks everyone. Thanks for organising it. And if I don't talk to any of your West Vic staff, have a great Christmas. We can say that now. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Safe. Appreciate it. Great presentation. See you again. All right. No worries. Bye. Okay.